Hey there, welcome to Market Call. I'm John Erlichman sitting in today. Nice to have you with us. Andrew Moffs is on the program today, Senior Vice President, Portfolio Manager at Vision Capital. We will be fielding your questions on real estate stocks. And as always, you can give us a call toll free, 1 855 326 6266. If you want to send us an email, we will gladly accept those as well. Market Call at bnmbloomberg.ca is our address. And we welcome Andrew back to the program. Andrew, nice to see you. Good to see you. Thanks for having me on. Let's uh, let's talk a little bit about the environment for investing in real estate names. I know you fielded a lot of questions about this interest rate environment, how you navigate right now. But what's your general assessment of the mood of the markets when it comes to real estate names these days? Well, I'll put it this way: real estate in the public markets has probably been the most unloved sector since the beginning of 2022. Um, we have record underweight in terms of fund flows into the sector, but all that is changing. I think the fall of 2023, when you had the pivot from the Fed signaling that we are at the end of Fed rate tightening, is very constructive for publicly traded real estate. You know, we've looked back in time and we've looked at what happens at the end of a Fed uh, hiking cycle. And typically REITs outperform and typically up on average 24% in the four quarters post Fed uh, stopping raising interest rates. So that's the backdrop in the public markets. We look to the private markets and fundamentals in the right sectors are continue to be quite strong. Pricing is now coming, uh, becoming more evident with interest rates no longer going up. People are able to figure out their cost of capital. And if anything, the public market should be winners coming out of it. And we can talk a bit more about that. Well, let's uh, also just give our audience a taste before we start taking questions around the areas that could outperform, because real estate is a big area of investing. You cover a lot of it. What are the things that you're thinking about when it comes to the best opportunities right now? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, when you think about real estate valuation, so much focus is on interest rates. And the question is why? Well, the answer is, um, interest rates really dictate the cap rate. The cap rate is the going in yield when one buys a property. There's nothing any of us can do about that cap rate, about interest rates. So you have to focus, well, what are you applying that going in yield to? You're applying it to the net operating income of the property, meaning where is income going in the future? And so that's all we focus on at Vision, the supply and demand fundamentals of different markets. So to answer your question, we're so focused today on industrial warehouse real estate. It's such an easy call. When you have rents today that are 40% uh, above where the in-place market rents, where the in-place rents are in your leases, you have a tremendous mark-to-market opportunity. So we're very focused on that, both in Canada, the US, globally. We're focused on housing, uh, whether it's in the form of manufactured housing, uh, which is very defensive, uh, never had a negative year of net operating income growth. And we're very focused on grocery anchored shopping centers where the income is very uh, defensive. Uh, you have strong internal growth and it's really a covered land play. You have the opportunity to look for higher and better use of those parking lots surrounded by your real estate. So to us, those are some great sectors to be focused on. Okay, that is a great stage setter, Andrew, and I know we'll be getting a number of inquiries around those various areas as we roll through Market Call. Andrew Moffs with us from Vision Capital, taking your questions on real estate stocks. We'll be right back. We'll get right into it on today's edition of Market Call. Okay, it is time for some inquiries on Market Call today. Our focus is real estate stocks. Andrew Moffs joining us. And we're going to start with an email. This one comes from Ash. It is on CubeSmart. CubeSmart, I think they, they're in the self-storage facility business. And it's just a general question, your opinion on the business. Uh, so, yeah. So, CubeSmart is the third largest operator of self-storage in the United States. I think it's about a $10 billion market cap. Dividend yield today is in the 4 7 range, I believe. Um, typically, the sector is very defensive. Um, and hence, it's always one we always look to own. Today, we are not owners of the U.S. self-storage business. There is a wide range of outcomes as to what will happen to operations this year. Uh, there is very little clarity just because uh, this was a sector that did so well in the pandemic, and there was a, a great ability to, ability to increase rates at higher than inflation. Uh, today, that has quickly gone in reverse. And in fact, we find that street rates, which is the rate one pays when they walk up to a new self-storage facility, is 
below um, the current in place rents and actually below, at it around 2019 levels. So what does all that mean? CubeSmart's gonna have negative bottom line FFO earnings growth this year. It's not a stock we would wanna to own today. That's really helpful context. And for what it's worth, it looks like on Wall Street right now, the majority of the analysts are taking a wait and see approach on CubeSmart. We also have another email. This one comes from Martin and it is on Simon Property Group, certainly a well-known real estate operator in the United States. Simon just wants to get your take on the business. Yeah, so Simon Property Group is the largest Class A enclosed mall operator in the United States, frankly, globally. Um, they also have a great outlet center business as well as some investments uh, abroad in Europe and in Asia. Uh, you know, the mall sector defied everyone's expectations in the late part of, you know, call it 2015 through 2019. People thought the mall would be dead. And that was pretty much true for anything that was a B mall and below. But the A malls have really shown their resilience. And Simon has been able to operate pretty adeptly through uh, what has been a more difficult operating environment for retailers, uh, just given their transition to e-commerce. Uh, this is a stock, it's, it's done quite well over the past year as people have turned back onto this sector. And I expect it to continue to do so. I think the Class A malls will continue to thrive. And Simon has done a great job of working with uh, their tenants, looking for better tenants, more experiential lifestyle type of tenants as the mall moves away from the typical department stores, which no longer have relevance in the market today. Okay, helpful breakdown there. Martin, we thank you for that email question. And uh, we're gonna get to the phone lines now. Joining us from Chilliwack, BC, Andre. Hello. Oh, can you hear me? We can hear you, yeah. yeah. Oh, great, thanks, uh, John. Uh, Andrew, you seem to be uh, smiling a little bit lately. Things are definitely turning around in the real estate reek. Uh, I'd like to hear your thoughts, please, on, on Allied Properties. Uh, I know you uh, cover it. I'm wondering, do you own it? Uh, it's quite a bit down. It's paying a 10% dividend. And uh, maybe you could just give us an update on uh, what's happening with the uh, return to the office space. Uh, the media has sort of dropped the story. I'm just wondering, is it, uh, are things normalizing and everybody coming back to the office? Uh, I'd appreciate your comments and your thoughts on Ally Property. Thank you. Have a good day. Okay. Uh, well, I'm smiling. Life is good. Uh, we are all back in the office. So if that's any... Uh, a dictator as to what will office use, but not everyone is. And of course, that's going to be a headwind for office use and demand going forward. I think those negative headlines are pretty much behind the office sector. And now it's a show me story. What does that mean? Can one lease the same amount of space they did prior to the pandemic uh, as, uh, uh, you know, can they do that today? And at what cost? Um, you know, Allied put itself in a great spot uh, about a year ago when it sold its data center portfolio and gave itself some breathing room in terms of its distribution yield, as well as its uh, debt metrics. Um, I would say, and it's pretty much consensus among analysts, if you look back a month ago, they, they announced a, a transaction that might have put them a step backwards, at least temporarily, in terms of uh, some of those goals, in terms of breathing room on the distribution and as well on their debt metrics. They, had, they have a relationship with a developer um, that uh, is troubled itself, perhaps not the assets, but the developer. Uh, they had Mezlons out to that developer, and today, uh, they recently, they announced that they were going to take in those loans and convert them to equity. What that did, however, is uh, you know to the tune of five percent uh, hurt earnings, F, you know FFO bottom line earnings growth this year. Uh, leverage ticks up quite considerably, about one turn in debt to EBITDA, and that distribution coverage, that holy grail in terms of the dividend yield, um, that's gotten a lot tighter given this transaction. So I think the market is now completely in a show me story state where it says, uh, can Allied lease space? And more importantly, can it sell $200 million worth of assets to pay down uh, the debt that they have to take on in order to buy these two new buildings from this troubled developer? So um, I'm not ready to make that kind of bet on the office space today. And, uh, you know, there will be winners and losers uh, in the office space going forward. Allied certainly has a strong portfolio, but they're, they're facing a lot of headwinds in the market. Andrew, I just want to ask a quick follow-up because I think with Allied specifically, historically they were thought as a, uh, a player that uh, in part catered to, let's say, technology companies. I, I do wonder when you're thinking about the return to work, do you think about the actual businesses that are operating space within any particular property? Does it does it differentiate between, I don't know, the tech sector and the banking sector? 
Yeah, it, it definitely does. You have to, you know, what we do, we, we go bottom up. You really have to go asset by asset, understand, is this, a, you know, any typical office building? Is it a large block user? You know, are they leasing full, you know, 10,000 square foot floor plates to a single user, multiple users, law firms, you know, that go from 10 uh, floors in a building down to eight? That's a significant reduction in space. You know, typical ally building, to your point about tech users, they've had much smaller users. Um, you know, some, certain buildings, you know, completely leased off to Shopify. That's a different example. But their bread and butter has been more that smaller tenant that typically will stay in their space. Um, maybe they don't need as much space, but they're not taking down perhaps a full floor uh, or multiple floors, I should say. So you really have to go uh, asset by asset and understand, uh, you know, how allied's, you know, typical portfolio, how has it changed over time? You know, we've seen them buy, uh, you know, full office buildings in downtown Montreal, very different than the brick and beam building that people consider here in Toronto on King West. Okay, good context there. Andrew, uh, hold tight. We are going to take a quick break, but we, uh, to our Market Call audience, are going to be taking more of your questions and emails when we return. Real estate stocks is our focus today with Andrew Moffs. You can give us a call, 1-855-326-6266. You can email us a Market Call at bnmbloomberg.ca. Call. We're fielding questions today on real estate stocks. Andrew Moffs is our guest, and we're going to go back to the phone lines now. Alan is uh, on the line in Toronto. Hi, Alan. Yeah, hi. Thank you very much for taking my call. Actually, I'm in Montreal, but that's okay. I want to ask Thanks. Andrew's opinion on BSR REIT. I bought it on his recommendation about three, uh, three, three and a half years ago, and originally did very well, but it's come down quite a bit, I guess, because of the high interest rates. Is this the rate that he would recommend today, and should I hold on to it or sell it and buy another one? Thank you so much. Have a good day. Thank you. Yeah, so BSR REIT uh, is one of these unique type of vehicles that owns U.S. real estate, but listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange. They own multifamily apartments in the U.S. Sunbelt, focused Houston, Dallas, Austin, Oklahoma City, and Little Rock, Arkansas. Um, this is a very tight portfolio, well managed. Um, the reason the stock has underperformed quite dramatically uh, has partially to do with interest rates, but more so, more recently, uh, is supply. Uh, you know, the reason they're in the U.S. Sun Belt is that there's tremendous demand. L lots of Americans are moving from the coast of the countries to these Sun Belt states. Typically, these are no tax, uh, you know, no state income tax states where they're leaving jurisdictions like California and New, and New York. So we've seen a lot of job growth, a lot of um, in migration. Developer, this is, has not been lost on developers and developers are good at uh, developing buildings when they see demand and that demand is being met with a lot of supply. A million units under construction in the United States that will be delivered this year and next. So notwithstanding, BSR is doing its best, operating uh, well in, within its submarkets. It is faced with a material headwind. And uh, as a result, we do not expect uh, the same level of internal growth that we'd seen in previous years when we were recommending this stock. Um, this could be a very good setup for 2025. Uh, you know, I'm not negative on U.S. multifamily in the Sun Belt permanently. It's just a temporary phenomena of uh, uh, really not having pricing power today. So it's, if you own the stock, uh, it is trading at a discount to net asset value. So you're probably in a good position to hold on and collect the yield and hope for better uh, total return in 2025. Okay. We are going to stay on the phone lines now because Bill is joining us from Bowmanville, Ontario. Bill. Thank you for taking my call. I'd like your guest's opinion on Main Street equity. If it's done well in the past year, does he see more upside? Thank you. Yeah, Main Street Equity is a really interesting corporation, very much focused on Western Canada, concentration in Edmonton and Calgary, uh, as well as uh, Surrey, British Columbia, uh, and going a bit east from there all the way to Winnipeg. Um, we really like this company. It's uh, pretty much a liquid. It's hard to trade, but if you do have a holding, I would definitely hold on to it. Uh, this company has been adept at growing its portfolio base and its net asset value, uh, despite not having to issue any equity, which is really the holy grail within real estate in such a capital intensive business. Um, we really like the Western Canadian apartment markets today, 
specifically Alberta and Saskatchewan, where there is no forms of rent control. So um, that's not to say that rents are going up unnecessarily. Uh, you know, demand is uh, uh, you know being met with supply in some cases, but uh, responsibly, uh, you're seeing rents go higher. And you know, the, as a result, net asset value continues to go higher. So this is a stock we own in our portfolio, and we continue to hold it. Quite a move there, uh, to your point. Main Street Equity, we appreciate that one call from Bill. We're going to go back to the phone lines. Jordan is joining us from Calgary. Hey, Jordan. Hi there. Good morning, and uh, thanks for taking my call. Uh, my question is about Prologis. Uh, what are your thoughts on the commercial and industrial real estate sector? Thank you very much. Yeah, so Prologis is really the bellwether for industrial real estate globally. It has a market cap north of $115 billion. And you think of that metric, it's probably bigger than the entire Canadian REIT market. Um, this is a really great enterprise. Uh, they are really good at operating logistics assets globally. But they don't just, they're not simply a mutual fund of, of uh, industrial warehouse buildings. They own these buildings in the best markets uh, globally. Um, we own Prologis in the fund today. Uh, we think it's a great opportunity to buy a REIT that has robust internal growth, trading at a discount to net asset value. Uh, conservatively, we think this stock uh, could be worth up to you know $140 on a net asset value basis, let alone the stock should be trading at a premium to that, given what a great company it is. And it has the levers to pull. You know, when you think of ESG, um, you know, this enterprise has the ability to come up with new revenue drivers, whether through solar or EV. Um, there's some interesting things this business can do, and we're only at the beginning of that. And the analyst target price right now, 144 among the roughly 30 who cover it on Wall Street. So to your point there, Andrew, we're going to take a quick break, continue to take great questions on real estate stocks on Market Call today. We're also going to take a look back at Andrew Moff's past picks. Stay with us. That's coming up next. Welcome back to Market Call. Real estate stocks is the focus today. We're going to go through some past picks now with our guest, Andrew Moffs. Starting, Andrew, with First Capital REIT, which was a name that was recommended, I guess, going back to early last year. The performance uh, is, in terms of the total return, down over the period since you recommended it. But you did mention earlier that you're pretty constructive on real estate plays tied to grocery stores. How do you feel about First Capital now? Uh, even more constructive, I think, uh, well, I believe, uh, First Capital is the best grocery anchored shopping center portfolio globally, period. Um, they have a tremendous portfolio focused only on urban centers in the key markets in Canada at the right intersections, where you have the ability to buy 22 million square feet of top producing grocery anchored shopping center uh, real estate, plus a further 24 million square feet of future density. You know, one of the unique characteristics about the public markets uh, that is great for stock pickers like us is that the markets are not great at valuing development nor density. And only about a third of the value of uh, uh, First Capital's future development pipeline is in that net asset value. And currently, you can buy that stock at a 3% discount to that intrinsic value. Plus, you have a 5.5% yield while you wait. Um, this is a company that puts up three to four percent earnings growth combined. You know that's an eight to nine percent current return. Plus, you have all this upside as this great portfolio gets monetized over time. Okay, and then one of your other past picks is Sun Communities. You were talking earlier in the program about manufactured homes as an area you continue to watch. Um, in terms of the outlook for that one, uh, what's uh, what's your current perspective there? Yeah, what we love about the manufactured housing community sector is that it is so defensive. Uh, you know, right now there's an undersupply of housing in the United States, and this type of real estate is really the last bastion of affordable housing one can find. Uh, Sun Communities operates in this sector. About 55% of its portfolio is focused on these type of prefab homes. Uh, you know, a further 25% of the portfolio is in recreational vehicles, RVs, and about. Um, 20% of the portfolio in marinas. You know, we look at the supply and demand characteristics of those sectors. You have 12 boats, uh, 
to every one marina slip. You've got you know, six and a half RVs to every one site where they can be parked. So there's really a mismatch between de demand and supply. And hence, many uh, some communities has never had a year of negative net operating income growth. Uh, you have the ability to buy this REIT at a 15 to 20% discount to net asset value today. It's got a 3% current yield. Um, we think this is a great opportunity in the public markets. Uh, there's very few, there's been very few times in history where you can buy this type of sector at a discount to net asset value. Uh, this happened in the great financial crisis. It happened in March 2020, and it's happening here again today. All right, an endorsement there. And the third pass pick that we just want to highlight for our audience today, American Homes for Rent. And since that recommendation, it has been a notable gainer. How do you feel about the business now? It's a great business. The fundamentals are so strong in single-family rental homes. Um, as a result, the stocks have done quite well, the stocks being American Homes for Rent and Invitation Homes, and then Tricon, which is the subject of a takeover uh, by Blackstone. Um, we have since sold American Homes. Uh, it traded near our net asset value of uh, $37 previously in the year. Uh, this, the company's also been active selling shares uh, in the market above $36, so I think it gives you an idea of value. But uh, any opportunity to buy this stock on a pullback, we're, we're there because we really do like the fundamentals. Uh, this is a great opportunity for Americans to live the dream of single family homes, be in a, in a home with a backyard, uh, you know, barbecue, a place to work. Uh, but if they cannot afford the mortgage, they can rent the home. Okay, some good context there on your past picks. We are going to take a quick break, come back. Andrew Moffs will be with us, continuing to take your question on real estate related stocks. He's with Vision Capital. If you want to give us a call, please do so now and uh, send us an email. We'll look forward to hearing from you. We're coming right back. We are continuing today's edition of Market Call with questions on real estate stocks. Andrew Moth's joining us. We have an Andrew on the phone lines now from Calgary. Hi, Andrew. Hi, thank you for taking my call. Can I get uh, your guest's opinion on uh, Granite REIT? Thank you. Granite REIT, sure. Yeah, uh, Granite's uh, the largest uh, industrial REIT uh, listed in Canada, uh, owns a diverse portfolio across the United States, Canada, and Europe. 20%, uh, uh, I believe, of the portfolio uh, today, oh, sorry, 30% of its portfolio is leased to Magna, the auto parts uh, manufacturer, uh, and a lot of that concentration is in Europe and Austria. Um, this is a well-managed, well-run, good properties. It's the stock uh, is having a tough time getting out of uh, this mid seventy dollar range. It should be in that ninety to one hundred dollar range for sure, just based on the value of its real estate. Part of the reason is uh, the focus of its buildings. Its buildings in the industrial space are focused on large box, typically three hundred thousand square foot warehouses. And what you're finding, just given where the economy is today, notwithstanding the strength in this market and warehouse market, users are taking a bit longer to make decisions on when to lease. Uh, simply because it's a lot, diff lot more difficult for the CFO uh, of a company to approve a big spend and you're having to uh, withstand a large spend today in terms of warehouse rents. And so if they can stay in their place, maybe, maybe renew month to month or a short term lease as opposed to making a big decision on a new development, which is typically what uh, granted the type of building they have, uh, they're taking longer to make those decisions. We fully expect uh, that to get digested and granite will put up some better leasing and better occupancy numbers in the second half of this year. Uh, but for now, it's a bit of a show me story. So you have a great opportunity to buy stock trading at a 10, 15% discount uh, over 4% yield. Uh, so yeah, I'd be comfortable owning granite here. Okay, good to get that context. We're going to go back to the phone lines now. Amy is joining us in Toronto. Hi, Amy. Oh, hi, and Andrew. Um, I'm questioning on action our week. I've been holding it for about two years. Um, there's some dividend um, earned, um, but the stock seems to be a little bit um, like a, not moving or declining. So I wonder if I should um, sell it or hold on to it. Thank you. I'll hang up and listen to uh, Andrew's and Wilpon. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. H&R REIT. 
Yeah, having followed REITs long enough, it, uh, it's a very easy answer to say di diversified REITs are difficult stocks to own in a bear market. And that's what h &R is. It, it has investments in some belt apartments, in industrial warehouse in Canada. It has retail in the United States. It's got a few more office buildings, but really their uh, density and rezoning plays in the greater Toronto area. Uh, all these things have value. Um, and this stock trades at quite a discount to net asset value as a result. But the earnings momentum just isn't there today, and it really is a show-me stock. Uh, the company's going through a bit of a rationalization, trying to refocus its efforts solely on U.S. apartments as well as warehouse. Um, but it's going to take some time, as this is a very difficult market to sell assets into. Uh, as a result, uh, it is a value stock, show-me story. Uh, you earn a nice 6.5% distribution yield while you wait. Uh, you might just have to wait a little longer to see that value realized. Okay, we are going to go back to the phone lines now. Glum joining us in Toronto. Hi there, what's your question? Oh, hi, good afternoon, gentlemen. My question is on Tricon Residential. Um, I see there is a, uh, a takeover uh, for about uh, $11 uh, US, I think. And the stock is currently still trading at $15. I need to know what I should do with it. Wait for a, a higher bid coming in, or should I sell it, or just wait till I receive the money for it? Uh, your advice would be appreciated. Right. So Tricon is the subject of a takeover by Blackstone. Uh, this was actually the 21st takeover of a name in our portfolio in the past 15 years. Um, you know, as I mentioned before, we're quite constructive on the single family rental space and Tricon operates there. It's a great company, uh, great assets. And that was not lost on Blackstone uh, when they came along and privatized uh, an offer to privatize the company. Um, that, you know, the shareholder vote is in the next week. Um, we expect this to close sometime next month. Um, I would never give tax advice, so that's up to the individual holder if they should hold on to this through closing or take uh, the gains today. You still have some upside uh, between you know where it trades today and the and the uh, offer price by Blackstone at this point. You, you should not expect a higher offer to come in. Can I just ask a quick follow? Because Blackstone has made it very clear that they are interested in the Canadian real estate market. Um, how do you think about that larger trend? You you addressed some of the many companies really that have been acquired that were in your portfolio over the years. That is probably the number one thing that makes us excited about the space uh, that we're investing in today in publicly traded real estate. You have the opportunity to buy this sector on sale uh, relative to the private market. That is not lost on Blackstone. Uh, you can't underestimate what I said at the outset of the program in terms of understanding where interest costs are today. You know, we first benefited from Summit uh, Industrial REIT being taken over by the Singapore Sovereign Wealth Fund, GIC, uh, at the end of uh, 2022. That was our 20th takeover name in our fund. What was unique there was that, you know, as a pension, uh, as a sovereign wealth fund, they didn't need any debt. What was very relevant in this transaction in Tricon's uh, privatization is that Blackson, of course, will need to take on financing in order to do this. They understood their cost of capital, and yet they were still able to buy Tricon at a 30% premium. Whenever you have a mismatch and you have that big of a spread between quality real estate on sale uh, in the public markets and $400 billion worth of dry powder in the private markets, uh, you got to think that your risk reward is to the upside. Uh, and so that's why we're as constructive as we are on publicly traded real estate. And the fact that Blackstone, who's the largest buyer of REITs, um, is focused on Canada can only be a positive. Okay, thanks for connecting those dots. We do want to go back to the phone line now. Win uh, in Windsor, Ontario, Brent is joining us. Hey there, Brent. Hi, happy Easter, gentlemen, and thanks for taking my call. I'm a long-term believer in the growing need for data centers, and thus I'm a long-term investor in Equinix. But this Heidelberg short report has me a little worried. I was wondering what your thoughts were. Thank you in advance. Thanks a lot. Uh, you know, we do a lot of real estate tours, um, and uh, we had the ability actually last week to visit Equinex's headquarters um, and uh, visit them in San Francisco, in South San Francisco. And it was pretty timely because it, ca it came out at the time of uh, this short report on on Equinex. Um, you know, this 
is not new news in the sense of uh, how capital expenditures are portrayed either on balance sheet or on the income statement. Um, and you, you know, at this point, uh, you know, management has come out as as hard as they can and, and defended defended it. I think expect more to come, and I think the stock's already responded in such a way that uh, it's already recovered the losses um, from that day of that short report. You know, we're very much focused on the private value of the real estate and the supply and demand factors. We think data centers. Um, you're about to see explosive growth as artificial intelligence requires you know, anywhere from five to 10 times the amount of power and data processing than um, anything before it. And there's just simply is not enough real estate to keep up with the needs to power all this information. So Equinix is really in a great spot. It's a well-run company. Uh, yes, you have to digest some short-term noise um, and uh, it remains to be seen uh, what the results of uh, the subpoena will be uh, with the company. But at the end of the day, we feel very good about the real estate. And so uh, you can feel comforted by that. Okay, that's some good context there. And for our audience members who want more context on that particular story about the short report, we have it on our website, bnbloomberg.ca, where we have lots of investment ideas. And we're going to continue to go through some investment ideas here on Market Call with Andrew Moff, specifically on the real estate sector. We will be right back. You can give us a call, 1-855-326-6266. Back to the phone lines we go here on Market Call. Arthur is in Halifax. Arthur, welcome to the show. Thank you, gentlemen. Uh, I was wondering if I could get Mr. Mop's opinion on Crombie Real Estate Trust and whether or not he thinks the dividend is safe also. Thank you. Uh, so, yeah, the short answer is the dividend is very safe. Crombie REIT owns grocery anchored shopping centers, uh, principally uh, Least it's at least the grocer is principally leased to its parent companies, uh, Sobeys Empire. Um, they've uh, really done a great job of expanding the portfolio from its original base in eastern Canada all the way through to British Columbia. Um, we think there's a very stable business, internal growth rates in the two to three percent range, uh, very comfortable distribution coverage. So, I would be very comfortable owning this in what is a very defensive sector. Okay. And Arthur, we thank you for that phone call. Let's go from east to west. Peter is on the phone line in Vancouver. Hi, Peter. Hi. Thank you very much. And Mr. Andy Mox notes the real estate guru. Please, may I have your opinion on Minto? Do you think it will ever go back to $21? Thank you very much. Thank, okay. you. thank you, Peter. Yeah, yeah Minto. Yeah, so Minto is an apartment REIT uh, with a big concentration in Ontario, whether in Ottawa or Toronto or in Quebec and Montreal, uh, as well as uh, out west. Um, its parent company, Minto Group, has been operating for a very long time, sponsored this REIT uh, several years ago. And actually, the REIT trades below that IPO price, which is pretty remarkable given the value of apartment buildings have only gone higher since then. Um, you know. There is a lot of value in this REIT. It trades, as the caller said, trades at a wide discount and at asset value. The question is, uh, when will it close? Uh, you know, it, and how will it close? Uh, the company's now in a show me story state where they need to produce bottom line FFO earnings growth, and they're beginning to do so. Um, and I think they're making some smart capital allocation decisions. If you own the, this REIT, I would continue to hold on to it because I do believe anytime you can buy quality real estate trading at a discount in the right sector, uh, you're going to do well over the longer term. Okay, let's stay in BC. We have a call from Nanaimo. Bernie joining us now. Hi, Bernie. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Uh, Northwest Healthcare Properties, I've owned for a number of years. I really like the space except I don't like the uh, price performance. I, I would just appreciate any thoughts you have. Yeah, so Northwest Health is going through a strategic review. Uh, it continues to uh, uh, go on, yet they've made some management changes, which pro probably indicates uh, that if one is hoping for a complete sale of the company, it is not going to happen. They all operate in multiple jurisdictions globally. Uh, that is probably not the most efficient way for a Canadian REIT to operate when they do not have uh, an appropriate balance sheet to do so. 
Uh, there's a lot of headwinds for Northwest Health in terms of its balance sheet and its distribution coverage. Uh, there's a lot of execution. Simply put, there's a lot of execution that needs to occur in what has been a very quiet transaction market in real estate. So good assets, um, but not a lot of options today for the REIT to come up with a pretty clean story. So um, it might be a bit of a bumpy ride. They will come out the other end with a good portfolio, but it remains to be seen if they can hold on to that distribution in the, at the same level as today, given their higher leverage and tight coverage. Okay, we're gonna get back to the phone lines. Anne is joining us now from Scarborough in the Toronto area. Hi, Anne. Hello, uh, good afternoon, gentlemen. Andrew, may I please have your thoughts on RealCan? Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, RealCan's a blue chip REIT uh, in the shopping center space in Canada, uh, one of the largest REITs and oldest REITs here. Uh, they also have a growing uh, footprint in residential, and they're going to benefit this year from a lot of new development deliveries uh, coming online. That capital, whether in the form of uh, uh, net operating income uh, growing for the REIT or condos closing and that capital coming back to the REIT uh, will provide some nice uh, uh, debt pay down at a time where interest costs are going higher. Uh, the internal growth rate of this uh, company is you know, in that typical three to 4% range. Uh, you have a nice yield about 6%. Uh, this is a stock we own in our portfolio and I think it is uh, really a good stock to own going forward. Okay, and let's squeeze in one more phone call coming from Hugh in Ottawa. Hi, Hugh. Hi, I've been watching this show for 25 years. This is my first call. Welcome. Hi. We need a like a, a celebratory something or other. We'll work on it, Hugh. Thanks for calling. Uh, I own Camden Property Trust, and when I read what they're telling me is they can only raise their rents about 3%, and their costs are going up 3%. And they're also having difficulty with people moving out of California and New York. Um, is there any future in this thing? I have it by REIT. Okay. All right. Uh, so Hugh, thanks for the question. Yep. Yeah, so Camden Property Trust, the ticker is CPT. A very similar story to what I talked about, the Canadian REIT called BSR, uh, uh, ticker HOM. They operate in the U.S. Sun Belt. And what I described before is true with Camden. There is no pricing power today given so much supply. Uh, a lot of that, however, is priced into the stock. Uh, you have the ability to buy Camden probably at an implied cap rate in the high sixes, 7% range, which is uh, a pretty attractive cap rate to buy quality real estate. Um, you're not going to see the turnaround in 2024. Markets do a good job of discounting the future, so perhaps at the end of the year, people will be looking to 2025, where pricing power could very well return. Um, and so uh, if you've held on to Camden this long, uh, I think you have a better upside downside uh, than you certainly did a year ago, for sure. And so um, there might be better opportunities elsewhere, but uh, I, I'm pretty constructive about U.S. apartments in the latter half of next year. Okay, Andrew, thanks for breaking that one down and our thanks to Hugh for watching for more than two decades and for calling in today. We appreciate your viewership. Top picks coming up next with Andrew Moffs. Time now for Top Picks. Andrew Moffs still with us talking about some real estate names. The first one today, Andrew, is Dream Industrial. And you started the program by talking about how optimistic you are when it comes to industrial warehouse properties. D does this fit that bill? Yeah, definitely. This And this happens to be the cheapest play on industrial warehouse uh, anywhere. Um, Dream Industrial, two-thirds of its portfolio is in Canada. One-third is in Europe. They also have an investment in the United States through an open-ended fund of which they're the manager. Um, what I like about their real estate, it's very close to the population. When you have warehouse space, you want to serve uh, you know, people as close as possible as goods go in and out of your warehouse uh, with as much throughput as possible in terms of distribution. There's a big gap, 46% between the in-place rents and market rents, so you can see pretty robust internal growth of 9 to 10% annually, while the stock trades at a big 27% discount to NAV. You have a 5.5% distribution yield uh, while you wait for all that earnings growth. And, uh, you know, we think anytime you can buy this quality real estate at a discount, you're going to be in a good spot. 
Okay, and staying with the industrial theme, First Industrial Realty Trust is also on your top picks list today. Yeah, I, I thought it'd be important to just focus on one name that focused exclusively on the United States, given it's such a strong industrial market. Uh, what I like about First Industrial, it really zeroes in on 15 of the best industrial markets in the United States, and it has a heavy concentration in Southern California. And for those that appreciate, the Port of LA is the largest port in North America, where most of the goods uh, flow through the country. Um, you know, that concentration in California has been a bit of a pall on the reach simply because um, we've seen a slowdown in market rent growth. Not a slowdown in terms of rents going negative, but just the growth rate has slowed down. Um, you know, they have a big development pipeline, uh, and as a result, that development has been a bit of an overhang as it's waiting to get leased up. I look at it as, as the money's all been spent. You have the ability to only have upside here and buy the stock at a sizable 15, 16% discount to NAV, and you have nice 8 to 9% internal growth in what is probably the cleanest takeout story possible in publicly traded real estate in warehouse. Hmm. Okay, two industrial names covering the North American landscape. And then your third pick today is more about senior housing. It's Chartwell Retirement Residences. What stands out with this one? Uh, it's demand and supply uh, and a recovery in demand. Uh, first of all, on the supply side, you know, we had suffered from too much development of retirement homes going into the pandemic. It's almost non-existent today. Uh, on the demand side, we're finally seeing that baby boomer population uh, you know, turn into the prime renters for retirement homes. And that's what Chartwell operates. Uh, I think there's about seven and a half million seniors today in Canada. Well, that's going to 11 million uh, over the next uh, uh, decade. And uh, when you have that type of demand growth and uh, fewer and fewer options, Chartwell provides a great opportunity uh, to provide better living accommodations. Um, you know, they have seen their occupancy grow from the pandemic back to an 85% level. Their peak level was 93% and they're on the road to 95%. So we think you have a great ability to own uh, this trust trading at a big discount to net asset value. Plus you have all the upside of, uh, you know, over 10% growth in occupancy, uh, which isn't factored into street models at all. So uh, we think they operate quite well, trading at an 18% discount to NAV. And just a quick follow on to that, because we got some news today about record population growth for Canada over the last year. As the population ages, obviously the number of new Canadians has been rising. For anyone who's thinking about the housing side of REITs, does that simple story of supply and demand also ring true? Absolutely. That's been the, the, you know, the number one factor between the strength of Canadian apartments and by translation for seniors housing. Uh, and what's interesting, when you bifurcate some of that population growth of new immigrants to the country, a large portion are seniors. Um, and uh, they are in that prime renting cohort that will look more and more to retirement living if it makes sense for them. So yeah, that demand has really helped uh, the country overall. And then you have to look at interprovincial migration, which is another demand factor, which makes provinces like Alberta so attractive. All right. Great perspectives as always. Andrew, thanks very much for the top picks and for joining us here today on Market Call. Thank you. Andrew Roth's joining us. And uh, a reminder, as always, please consult a qualified financial advisor before making any investment decisions. Thanks for joining us. Hope to have you next time.